So let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that you have given us this morning, God. Now, Lord, you know we're nothing but flesh, and we ask you, God, to uh, speak to us this day. Lord, every one of us has failed you this week, God, in some way or another. And Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over our failures, Lord. And we ask you to prepare our hearts now, God, to be able to hear your word this morning. And Lord, may we get a glimpse out of your book, Lord, that you have so graciously, Lord, given to us that we may know you. I'm glad that you sought us, God, and you choose to have a relationship with us. God, we thank you for that. We praise you now. We love you. ask you to speak again to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at Isaiah. We're going to look at verse uh, chapter 52 first this morning. And really, uh, another example of how that the word of God was written as a, in a letter form. Uh, you know, it's been found, the Dead Sea Scrolls, as they call it. Of course, they were found at the Dead Sea in a cave. And uh, they were scrolls, so everything was written like that. Uh, you can actually see in the Word of God where Jesus took the scroll and he read it. And uh, so, uh, what I'm saying, saying that is that the latter part of chapter 52 belongs with chapter 53. So, uh, I want to look at this couple of scriptures this morning as we look at our suffering Savior this morning. We're coming up on Easter and we're going to be, and I hope you're reading the Gospels, and I hope you're reading this time of year how, uh, and how he was at that time. I tell you in John uh, 13, 14, and 15, it's amazing to put... John really goes in detail about his suffering and how it was coming up to his hour. Well, here we are, you know, some 700 years before Christ came, and God had shown the prophet Isaiah about his visage and how he was and about the crucifixion that was coming. You know, they all had their idea of what Jesus was going to be when he came. The reason the disciples couldn't understand why he didn't come and just set up his kingdom and others couldn't understand the Pharisees and all this, they couldn't see who he was. Yet many times Christ would carry them back to the Old Testament and say, it is me. And you remember in Luke 24, we may look at that next week, I'm not sure, but as he was walking on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, and those two Emmaus disciples, they couldn't understand who he was and said, Are you not a stranger in the land? And he took them, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, and expounded unto those things about concerning himself or who he was. That will be a sermon I'd love to hear one day. I love, and I believe I will. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be a lot of things we got questions on now, and they're going to be revealed when we get to glory, but he took and he went back to the Old Testament, and he shared with them everything concerning himself. And I want to tell you what a message that was, and that was like a six and a half mile journey they was on. And so, I, you know, how long did it take you to walk six and a half miles? I hadn't done the math, but I'm telling you, that was one a uh, glorious sermon to be able to hear and Jesus himself going back and pulling out all of the Old Testament prophets and things and Moses and all those prophets, the things concerning himself. So we find ourselves coming here this morning in Isaiah 52 and we're going to look at uh, verse 13 and 14 and then we will go into Isaiah 53. Uh, there's many other passages. Now, Psalms 22 is another passage you can go back and read, and you will find about the suffering of the Savior. They talked about, David's talked about, many bulls of Bashan have compassed him about. Yea, many bulls of Bashan. And what that means is, it, it's like uh, surrounding, if you would, a pack of wolves surrounding some kind of prey and then want to go in and hit him and another one would go in and hit him and another one would go in. 
And that's the picture there. And we're going to dig out some of that this morning as we go through talking about our suffering Savior. But in verse 13, in Isaiah 52, he said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted. Now don't forget that. Uh, if you just leave Christ on the cross, he will look like he was defeated, but he wasn't. And he isn't because he is God. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And then he said, as many as were astonished or astonished at thee. Uh, that simply means they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Have you ever seen something uh, take place and you just go, oh, <laughs> well, yeah, we have. Uh, so most of the time, uh, some, something comes out of our mouth when we see something like it. You know, so I can't believe what I just saw. Oh, have you ever come around the corner of the house and there'd be about a five foot snake laying right there? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah! I'll never forget one time, I ain't even thought about this till now, but I was weed eating one time and I was walking backwards, you know, just a weed eating and a weed eating. And I happened to turn around, there was a doggone king snake laying there about five foot long, and I'm talking about I was one step away from stepping on him. I jumped like I stepped on him. I mean, it just the reaction. It astonished me, <laughs> I'm telling you. Now when they looked at Christ here, the vision that Isaiah had, he said his visage was so marred more than any man. His visage was so marred. Now, I want to look at a couple of scriptures here this morning. Let's just flip to the New Testament for just a moment in Matthew 27. I'll pull it up here on the screen. And it's, again, dealing with the crucifixion of Christ in verse uh, 38. Let's see if i got the right one here. And, uh, well, there was two thieves crucified on the right. It's, that ain't what I want. It's Mark 15, 28. Excuse me. I can't get my glasses, I guess, so I can see here. But Mark 15, now that is, of course, he's talking about on the cross there. It is in context for that. But Mark 15 and verse 38. And the veil of the temple, of course, this is, I got it all messed up this morning. That's why I ain't got no notes, amen? <laughs> anyway, it's the crucifixion there, and, and I'm looking at the wrong one here in my reference notes, but let's just go back to Isaiah 52 and don't worry about it, amen? But it's talking about the crucifixion and him being, they said he was marred, his visage, his appearance did not look like a man. Now, a lot of things happened to our Lord before he got to the cross of Calvary. You know, they, and we depict that a little bit in our play. He was at a what's called a whipping post, and we have our guys up there on the whipping post, and they was the cat of nine tails. And, of course, that had bones, and it had pieces of metal, and it had all that. And the thing was about really about six foot long. And they would take it and they would hit him. And it would wrap around. And then they would just pull that thing back. Well, they was very skilled in what they did. These guys, just like any golfer or anything that you do every day of your life, that's all they do. These guys, that was their job. Now, they would get up in the morning and leave their families and do whatever and maybe kiss their kids on the head and go to work. And they practice with that whip all day long. Now I wonder what would happen if one day their son come up and had to be a part of that whipping post. Well, you don't think about things like that. But think about this. Here was the one that created them walking up to this whipping post. And they would already buffeted him. That means they, they hit him. They spit upon him. As you'll find out in some of the uh, references there. They done all this to our Lord. Yet they got here to the whipping post. And they, they hit him with those cat of nine tails. And they opened the flesh up. And his blood started spilling out everywhere. And he was so beating, beaten that they said his visage, his face was so marred. 
You know what something is when it's more. Now, I could really gross you out this morning if I wanted to and put you a picture of someone in some kind of accident that's been just marred. I mean, just pieces of flesh. That's what our Lord looked like. This is what Isaiah saw there concerning the cross. And more than any man, that is basically he was uh, more than any man could bear. His form was more uh, than the sons of men. So then we get into Isaiah 53. And of course, then uh, Isaiah says, Who had bleed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now notice this concerning <laughs> our sweet Savior here. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Now the example here is, uh, you know, it's just like, uh, you, you can cut grass one day and you can get up the next day and there's little dandelions and little things coming up just overnight. But they're tender. You can go up to them and just pluck them up. Pluck them up. There's nothing much to them. They're vulnerable. And that's the picture we have here. He will grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. You know, if the ground is dry and the root is withered, there's nothing there. You can just pull it up with no problem. He said, He hath no form nor comeliness. And, and when we shall see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. Now, uh, I hate to say it, but the Scripture teaches us that Jesus was not a good-looking man. He was not. They, they were some reason, God, and I think it would be because of the attraction to uh, him that God didn't allow him or he didn't allow himself to be something beauty. The Bible says there is no beauty that we should desire him. And I think God had a plan and a purpose for that. Uh, didn't want to have no uh, people following him because of his looks. It's because of his works which he glorified God the Father. It's the things that he did. If you'll read your Gospels, as you read on through, you'll see that everywhere he went, man, all the people would come out and he would heal every one of them. He would stay there till they was healed and he would cast out demons. He would uh, do all kind of things to these people. Well, that's why they followed him. And Jesus even made the comment to the uh, Pharisees and told them, said, look, do you, you follow me? Do you condemn me because of the works? Or you condemn me because you're envious and jealous and those things. And that's what they did. But they did not follow him because of his beauty. He said, we shall see him. There's no beauty that should be desired him. He is despised and rejected of men. And still today, people despise this world, despise and rejects the Jesus Christ because it's him that divides everything. It's Him. You, you can say God. You can mention, uh, you know, I thank God and all this. And they let all these people do it. But the moment you pull yourself out and you identify with Jesus Christ, then you are separated. That's it. I ain't having nothing to do with it. Everything's good. People can talk religion, talk all that. Even in our schools today, you know, you can... Uh, want to get in trouble. They want to get your kids in trouble for bringing a Bible. But I bet you can take a Koran and nobody say nothing to you. That's the time that we live in. That's where we at. Nothing has changed. The Pharisees and all those, they despised him. He was despised and rejected of men. They rejected him. Men still do today, but notice this now. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That's not what we have in our head as a picture of who Christ was. But he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, sickness, and pain. So I, I give you an example of my daughter had slammed her finger, got it slammed in the door, whatever, the other day, and the thing was all purple, and she was still crying when I got home. And, I said, don't worry, your daddy, you know, hits his finger sometimes with a hammer. And, uh, you know, it all bruises up and hurt. I said, but what I try to do is to think 
And this says, I do. I try to think, Lord, you suffered a whole lot more than this for me. And that's what we got to keep in mind. And that's what we got to know. He was acquainted with grief. He bore our pain. as we And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Like, I can't believe he is doing this. Now, he is, this is a picture of him at the cross and going to the cross there and the suffering that he did and we hear as it were our faces from him. Well, that was a prophecy that did take place. They scattered. They left. His disciples there, they was Mary and John and, and I think James there, but Peter was gone and a lot of the others was gone. They fled. And if we ain't careful, we can be a, find ourselves ashamed in the same way. But in context here, he's on the cross. He's suffering for us. He's acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows. Doesn't sound like to the world a king that we ought to follow, but he go, done all this for us, and we'll see in just a moment. And he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So I want to ask you, whose sorrows and whose grief did he become? Ours. He carried every bit of ours. It wasn't his. He was God. He left the throne room of glory for us and come down and died for us. He took on the form of a man. So that means he became a man. He done everything. He suffered it all. There's a song. He suffered it all for me. Yeah, he did. He done exactly that. He bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Notice the two distinction there. He, he carried those. He carried them out. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But notice this now. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Ours transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. That's a present tense term. It's still today. The blood is still there. The power of the blood is still there. And I thought about this song as I heard it on the radio yesterday about that little boy he couldn't go to sleep. You remember, he wondered why the little lamb had to die back in when the blood had to be put on the doorpost. He couldn't understand why that little lamb had to die. He, was, he couldn't go to sleep that night. Imagine the blood that was spilled and shed all out during that time uh, when the firstborn of Egypt was going to die and when that death angel passed over. Yet when he saw the blood, he would pass by that house. Can you imagine the screams that was taking a place across the land? Can you imagine all the little lambs that was being killed at that time? And you had to hear them from a long way off. And the blood was put over the door. And the, the song goes on to say, I, I, you know, can we look and see if the blood is still there? Well, it's still there. The blood is still there. And I want to tell you over the doorpost of your heart this morning, if you're a child of God, you can walk out and you look at your own doorpost, if you will. The blood is still there. He said that he was wounded for our transgressions. And by his stripes we are healed. Then he says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And watch this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he became sin for us who knew no sin. That is what, when you know, when you're witnessing the people and you're trying to talk to them, if they can ever see this. But you know what? You've got to get them into the book and get them exposed to the gospel or they're not going to see this. And can you remember the first time you really seen this? After you were saved. I mean, you didn't see this before. When God turned the light on and you saw this, it was like, wow, what he done for us. Now you know why he is highly exalted. Now you know why that every knee is going to bow to him. Because he suffered for us. He laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. And so, like I said, he became sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Then he said in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. So let me tell you, let me ask you this. Why do you and I think we're not going to be that way at times? We're going to be oppressed. We're going to be afflicted. We're going to be sick. There's days when we're going to want to quit. There's days when we're going to want to be healed and get this suffering over with. But I'm telling you, he suffered all for us. He took it out of the way. And one day it's going to come to pass. We're going to have that glorified body. We're going to lay all this worldly things down and we're going to know him because of the stripes or uh, because of the nail prints in his hand and the wound on his side we're going to know him he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he has brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb so he opened not his mouth now think about that ain't it amazing you can take a sheep and you can pull it up videos if you want to, even right now. They still put the shears on the sheep today. They still uh, wool that comes off of the sheep. But they'll bring them in. They don't fight them. Oh, sheep just go right up. You ain't even got time now. I mean, it ain't like he's raised in a, you know, your house or something. That's just their nature. The sheep will go up. And like I said, it ain't like a pit or something. You just put your hand in it and bzzz, bzzz, and you just sit there. Let you shave them. You done? Send them on out. Well, the Lord Jesus became sin for us, allowed God to do this, allowed the iniquity of us all to be placed upon him. And as that's why he's talking about, it. use that example. As he was uh, sheep before the shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Then he goes on to say he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was his stricken. Now that's talking about Israel there. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. See, he died just like any of them. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The Bible talks about he died for the just and the unjust alike. It rains on the just and the unjust. Because before we was just, we was unjust. <laughs> Amen? So we, we want to put ourselves in a category. Sometimes if we ain't careful as believers, we put ourselves, kind of categorize it like uh, we ain't never been lost or something. Or we've never failed. Or we've never been in their position. And a lot of times, that's what we got to do. We got to put ourselves and remember who we was before the Jesus came and saved us, before the light was turned on. He brought us all. See, that's one thing about the cross. It brought God to man. And He stretched out His arms and He brings the, the light and the darkness together. Everything is brought together. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing our trespasses unto us, but has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling, pulling the world to himself. Now watch this as we go on through here. He says in verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, you got to see a big picture of being able to, to see this and, and God the Father look beyond our faults and saw our needs. You know how the song goes. That's exactly what he did. <clears throat> At any time, what did Jesus say? He said, I can bring 12 legions of angels right now. Wipe you all out. And he could have. But he looked ahead. He saw you and I one day as needing a Savior. He saw our soul uh, being able to not be in hell for all eternity. He loved us so much when He was on the cross. We was on His mind. And God the Father, as He was seeing His Son, remember now how we started out in chapter 52, His visions were so marred more than any man, and His form 
more than the sons of man. He was a beaten, bloody pup. And God had to look ahead and know that all these lambs, now you think about all the lambs and, and all the bulls and goats and turtle doves and stuff that was sacrificed. All those years, all the blood that was shed out and poured out, all the moans. Now, I just believe you, you take a, a, a goat or a bull or something, uh, maybe not a lamb, I don't know, he might give out some kind of bella, but uh, how many of you have heard the saying, you run around like a chicken with your head cut off? How many of you have ever seen that? Well, I know you have on that. You, okay. Three, four of us. I want to tell you what happens. Uh, listen, when they take old chicken, they grab that joke about a head and they wring it off. That's exactly how they used to do it. They had to chop it off, but usually they wring it off, wouldn't they? Like, wring that thing off. And it was, that's right. In the old time we used to have to do that. And I've seen it done. Well, that joke would go jumping around everywhere. And I'm talking about flopping like a fish out of water. Well, think about all these sacrifices that done that. They didn't know why, but God did. God looked ahead, and he saw all those sacrifices, and now the real sacrifice, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now the final payment for sin is being made. God was not going to turn aside and change his plans. It's all come together to wit. That God was in Christ. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. If the fullness of time had come here on the cross, now I know this is 700 years before as we're reading in this text, but when the cross came, God said it pleased Him. In other words, He was pleased with the sacrifice of His Son. He allowed Him to go through all of this for you and I. It said... He had put him to grief. Look at that in verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, and it pleased the Lord to put him to grief. And then he says, here's the future thing, when thou shalt make uh, his soul an offering of sin. He'll see his seed. You see, that's what it is. He saw ahead. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now here it is right here in all the scripture. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's the difference in all the other sacrifices made through all time. All that was an atonement, a covering. This sacrifice was the taking away. What did John say when he saw John the Baptist saw Jesus come? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. All the others was atonements. They just covered over. Uh, put a veil. It's just like if you uh, put something under that umbrella. They won't close. But the thing, <laughs> you put it under there. And it, it's, it's covered over. But then if you remove that and take it out of the way, that's exactly what he did. He has seen the travail of his soul and was satisfied. When Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, he looked. He said, tell us that. It is finished. It is finished. Now you think about that as we go through the Easter play. When he done that, and all the rumblings and all the things, and the people fell as dead men, and uh, it was done. No wonder he put the light out. He turned the light off, turned the sun out, made it dark for those three hours from 12 noon, high noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He made it dark, so he said, you know what, you're not going to look on. I believe it was so black. Now, I know we can get our eyes adjusted at night when we're out. Our pupils got to adjust and all that thing. But I want to tell you, when he cut the light out and God said, you're not going to look on my beaten, bloody son anymore. Because he became sin. He turned his back on him at that point. It was no longer just Jesus on the cross. It was <clears throat> sin hanging on that cross. Not a sinner, but sin. And he shut the light off and said, You ain't going to look at him no more like this. And he turned his back on his son for three hours. That's a long time to be under that kind of grief and stress and all this. 
yet it pleased him. And then when he said it's finished, that had to be about the time that the light come back on it. God allowed the sun to shine again. But don't think God can't look at that ball he created and say, go out. And that's exactly what he did. He covered it. He closed it off. Made it not to shine anymore. But it pleased him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul off. Well, verse 11. He shall see the smell of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Then of course the last verse there. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. All that took place on the cross. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Old Testament picture here of what you've done. And God, I know we can't do it justice, but Lord, I pray that you just continue to speak to our hearts and let us see more or how you suffered, but I thank you, Lord, that you didn't stay there, that you arose from the grave, and that's what we celebrate. We celebrate you today in Jesus' name.